introduce to you our next speaker. Uh, we have with us Dr. Mary Beth Happ. She is a nursing distinguished professor of critical care research and the senior associate dean for research and innovation at the Ohio State University College of Nursing. Dr. Happ is an NIH funded critical care and aging researcher. With more than 24 years of external funding support, HAP built a program of interdisciplinary practice-based research focused on improving care and communication with communication-impaired patients, families, and clinicians during critical illness and at end of life, particularly with patients receiving mechanical ventilation. She has specialty expertise in gerontology and critical care. Dr. Happ led the NIH-funded study of patient nurse effectiveness with assisted communication strategies that developed and tested a multi-component intervention to improve communication with non-vocal mechanical ventilated patients. She also serves on the editorial boards for Heart and Lung, the Journal of Gerontological Nursing and Geriatric Nursing, and has authored more than 190 journal articles, editorials, uh, invited papers, published abstracts, and book chapters. So. In recognition of the impact of her program and research, Dr. Happ was selected by the American Association of Critical Care Nurses to present the 2021 Distinguished Research Lecture. So Dr. Mary Beth Happ, thank you so much for being with us today. I will go ahead and um, stop and you can go ahead and present your slides. Thanks so much for that introduction, Nicole, and I'm, very happy to be here today with all of you and to share this time with you. My purpose today is to speak about communication techniques and strategies for the caregiver and patient. And you know, this is the has been the focus of my work as you heard for over 20 years now. But I do feel like I'm preaching to the choir and speaking to the experts so I'm really looking forward to the chat and to hearing um, your experiences with communication techniques and strategies. The work that I'm going to be referring to today has been supported by grants from the National Institutes on Health and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. While I do hold the copyright for the Speaks to Communication Training Program, it's publicly available on Ohio State's College of Nursing website. So where did I begin? Um, my clinical expertise is in acute and critical care. And um, one of my most memorable patients was a young man with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. His mother as caregiver and advocate for him in the hospital setting taught me a great deal. My research, as you've heard, has been about discovery and intervention development um, around this persistent problem of communication difficulty that patients experience in a variety of ways, certainly in critical illness with respiratory tract intubation, um, the inability to speak is profound, but patients have other kinds of acquired communication problems and they bring with them their communication uh, challenges. If it might be hearing or vision impairments or a past stroke. So um, this has been a, a passion of mine. I also have personal experience as a caregiver well into um, my career in research in this area. My husband developed a neurodegenerative disease, glioblastoma, um, which is brain cancer. So I found myself using many of the same strategies and techniques um, as I'm going to be uh, speaking with you about this afternoon. And so what are the underlying principles? 
All behavior has meaning and therefore is communicative. And we accept that in the animal kingdom, but kind of forget it with our human friends. All patients have the right to communicate with caregivers to the fullest extent possible. And here are, th th this precept or principle is supported by Joint Commission, which is the accrediting body for hospitals and rehabilitation facilities. And you can see from, I pulled out a couple of items from their checklist around advancing effective communication and um, the identification and addressing of communication needs is uh, supposed to be happening both during assessment, treatment, and the monitoring of changes in patients' communication status. And addressing communication needs means offering accommodations and communication support. And communication, we know, is a two-way street. It's a two-way interaction, and it's multimodal. As you've been attending this seminar today, you are um, both seeing visuals and, wor and written words, as well as the audio and, and a few gestures as, as you're even seeing the speakers. And so expecting patients to just um, get our messages as we talk at them is, isn't fair. So um, providing information in a variety of modes and making sure that they understand our messages as well as accommodating their special needs at, at delivering messages as important. So what are some of the challenges? Well, a big one is in misinterpreting and misunderstanding uh, messages. Some examples include uh, the patient who is mouthing words, has a tracheostomy and is mouthing words, and um, the nurse interprets it as a request for pain medicine, so pain. However, the patient is asking for pants. You can understand how that could be confused. Look in the mirror, pain and pants look really similar. Um, but unfortunately, the patient received pain medicine that likely prolonged uh, hospital course uh, because it was sedating and um, really needed pants. So the importance of, that teaches us the importance of validating messages and um, back with the patient. Currently, and for who knows how long, protective, personal protective equipment, PPE, also is a challenge as we are unable to use the cueing of full facial expressions and uh, a person's speech to uh, understand what they're saying, both for the provider and the patient. So locking eyes and making eye contact and facing patients um, and, and for the patient, your provider, is very important. Uh, the PPE can also muffle sound. So we've done some work on coaching providers on using these augmentative communication strategies writing out words, keywords, et cetera, to help patients understand what you're saying. Another principle is that communication abilities change. And so we need flexibility, um, multiple resources at the ready, and a plan. 
So I think your previous um, speakers talked about planning for healthcare encounters, and that may that might mean um, communication um, plan and um, written out sorts of messages as well as planning for change um, in communication abilities. Either, so there are temporary changes, um, particularly during acute illness that it's really good to have um, some plan or even practice in place. And caregivers are absolutely the communication partners for patients. And that takes a variety of forms, including uh, assisting perhaps in, in pointing or use of devices and um, communication tools and strategies. Family caregivers often act as interpreters and are thought of as interpreters by clinicians. This has pros and cons. So um, certainly uh, families know the person's um, individual idiosyncrasies, their gestures, their facial expressions and what they may be indicating they know um, common messages, likes and dislikes, and so um, they can be very important interpreters at the bedside or in a healthcare encounter. The, the downside here is that family caregivers tell us, I don't know, I, I've, never, I've never read lips, I can't read his lips or he, he's talking too fast or, or um, in, he might be weak. And, and so interpreting lips, mouth words are, are very difficult. And so assuming that family caregivers can do this without aids of any kind is unfair and anxiety producing. And so um, in our prior work, families told us this and also though we're very interested in learning about and learning how to use augmentative and alternative communication strategies. So my work has primarily involved clinician training and resources for communication based on those principles that um, I just introduced. And so the SPEAK study was a study that had in-person training for nurses that we I partnered with um, Dr. Katherine Garrett, who is a speech language pathologist extraordinaire, uh, really a pioneer in um, augmentative and alternative communication in the medical setting. And so um, we developed this nurse training program, um, supplied a variety of communication tools uh, low tech tools um, to intensive care units. And in the third arm of the study included electronic communication tools and um, individualized speech language pathologist consultation. In the second version, um, that was more uh, translatable, able to be used um, across intensive care units. We changed the um, communication training to an online training, and that's the one that I referred to you to earlier um, at OSU's website. And so that's the Speaks to study. 
we still supplied communication tools, um, low tech tools in that study and had speech language pathologists available on units doing rounds with patients and nurses. So the results of the, the speak study, the original study were that we showed greater communication frequency, back and forth communication. Um, and we did this by video recording nurse and patient communication um, for 89 dyads across um, three different groups. And we showed an increase in successful communication about pain and other symptoms. So these last two groups, these last two bar uh, columns um, in the graph are the intervention groups, the test groups. In this last group where we had electronic uh, communication devices and individualized um, speech language pathologist consultation, the patients reported significantly less difficulty with communication in, and greater use of a variety of tools. So what were, are those tools and techniques? Um, this is the formal definition of augmentative and alternative communication, AAC, and I would um, commend this website to you um, for that's a great resource on all things AAC. And I just can't emphasize enough the, um, the critical role that the speech language pathologist plays in assessing the patient, um, providing communication tools and techniques that are targeted to the individual's ability and uh, allow for this accommodation of maybe some waxing and waning of communication ability. And so that includes um, trying out strategies and devices that are both low tech and electronic. Um, and then really providing a, a, a written care plan so that everyone can follow it. And it's also important to have the speech language pathologist model those behaviors to nurses and family and other members of the team because it seems like, okay, this little communication board sheet and an alphabet board is, um, it is what it is. There's, there's no training that needs to be involved, but actually um, there's a right way and a wrong way. And um, so using the experts is, can make the difference in whether a technique is successful or not. I also highly recommend this website, the Patient Provider Communication Network. This is a group of speech language pathologists and disability advocates. Um, I am part of, of the forum and they have downloadable resources, communication sheets and boards. Um, they discuss patient provider communication across the healthcare spectrum. And as, as you've been talking about, um, I think uh, this morning and communication planning. So it's a great website. So the first part of that two-way street in patient communication is supporting the patient's understanding of our message. And so these are the, the steps in doing that, uh, that we teach nurses and are certainly good for, for everyone. I think, um, Keeping sensory aids at the bedside, glasses, hearing aids, hearing amplifiers seems like a no brainer, but sometimes it is, uh, you're, it's going against policy to wh where these um, 
items are sent home with family members when really that further impedes um, the patient's ability to communicate. So we advocate that those um, are present at the bedside. And then this initial step of establishing a consistent yes, no signal, um, which may be thumbs up for yes and closed fist for no, um, or head nods and head shakes if the person is able, that's the, the go-to one, but there, there are a variety of other signals that, that can be used for yes, no, but that, that message needs to be passed on um, to all who take care of the patient. And then using tagged yes, no questions really improves the patient's um, ability to understand. And this is weird uh, for us to think about, but I liken it to the preschool teacher mode of communication. So here we use this when a patient might be foggy, have has had some sedation uh, or set it sedating medications um, and you want to hold their attention to the end of a question. And so are you having pain? Yes or no? And so you're using the, the patient's tag, yes, no tag as you're speaking um, and giving that option to the end of the, the question. And it helps keep the patient centered on the question. We uh, certainly um, coach clinicians to speak slowly and distinctly with pauses. You might also have to coach clinicians to do that and to ask one question at a time. While I've become fairly skilled at asking one question at a time, it's not something that we typically do in our family interactions. So it was really an adjustment for me taking care of my husband to to do this and he would sometimes remind me he knew the technique and he would say you're doing it wrong when i stacked questions or didn't tag with the yes no at the end because he knew he really needed that and certainly using gesture to point um a, a deliberate gesture as you're speaking reinforcing that patience um, kind of lexicon of gestures is important. And I mentioned this earlier that writing key words about your message to, or you can use picture symbols if the, if it's a very young patient person or um, so someone who doesn't read, and here's an example of a message that I might give to a patient in, in the hospital setting. You're going for a body scan. We'll be taking you on a cart and I'll stay there with you. We'll be gone for about an hour. The test will take an hour. So you're saying these things, but also writing and pointing to the, the message to reinforce. For people with tracheostomies, um, certainly engaging respiratory therapy and speech language pathology in the use and fitting of tracheostomy speaking valves. Is, is, is he or she ready for the speaking valve kind of prompting on that regard? And for those who aren't ready or can't use um, or can't use full time a speaking valve, coaching patients to use their tongue and teeth when mouthing words. I've already discussed um, the high risk of misinterpretation, but so we coach patients and even show them you must exaggerate and we show them over enunciation 
and um, slowing down. And then when you still are having difficulty um, coaching patients to point to the first letter of the word on an alphabet board as they speak it both slows them down and for some reason it does help interpretation which seems counterintuitive because it seems like you do know the first letter that they're trying to speak but um we've we've tested this technique and it it really does help for those who can write and certainly testing writing abilities is important and we recommend um, these supports as well as um, particularly in the medical setting keeping legible pages for future reference um, and encouraging patients to point to you know those previously used kind of common messages so that they can save their energy and not um, rewrite. And this is called message banking or memoing. And it can be done um, to prepare in advance for an office visit, um, as well as in the hospital for physician rounds, um, or for when your, your family is visiting, or when the nurse is going to return becomes a bit of a communication diary. And so here are examples of communication boards and they range from very from the letter board um, and, and very simple boards to more complex. Um, here you see the speech language pathologist being the communication partner um, pointing so this is would be a patient who can't point um, so pointing to line by line uh, to the letters reading them out and having the patient use their yes no signal to indicate that that they have it right I always you, um, use a notebook at the bedside to keep track of, of what we're spelling out and to uh, validate, certainly validating is, did you mean A, um, as you go. This is an example of a picture uh, board for emotions and feelings. And so you see these boards can be uh, grouped according to category. And then there are commercially available boards that are um, a little more com complex. This is an example of a specialty communication board um, for spiritual care needs. Also, um, we can individualize and make families can um, create small boards or pictures with phrase picture boards with phrases and common messages. You can use sticker symbols, um, cardstock paper, and markers. And you can see that this one is organized uh, according to category. So this one is a wants and needs uh, communication board for that a patient um, would always bring to a, a hospital encounter because he had experience in knowing that, that these were the messages that he most often wanted to convey. This is a low tech eye gaze for persons who um, really have use of, of the eye movement primarily and so this really involves needs a little um, 
speech language pathologist training to use, but patients and, and caregivers catch on very quickly. So it's see-through and uh, on either side, the, so the care partner on the other side is able to um, discern what direction the patient is pointing to with their eyes. And there are certainly messages can be placed in these same positions. Um, it doesn't have to be alphabet. Notice that on this board and other and the alphabet board, uh, this important these control phrases of no, you got that wrong. Let's start over. Let's use something else is also important to have on a communication board. Now there are new eye gaze technologies that are electronic that are available um, as well. So the, the research and development in this area is exciting and uh, moving forward rapidly. Written choice technique is one where now we're going from one where you're using that written keywords, but in a bit of a different way. So here you're, you are asking the patient questions, WH kinds of questions, who, what, where, about a topic and formulating possible answers um, and printing those with bullet points on a page. Uh, this, the example in the picture shows um, Kathy Garrett, the speech language pathologist. She arranged them in a, uh, a map, a compass um, arrangement because her question um, was about where the patient had lived in Italy. And so you review each choice aloud as you point to them and then cue the patient to point to his answer or use the yes, no signal to confirm the answer. And so you circle it and then confirm, like, oh, you lived in Southern Italy. And she went on with this patient to then talk about foods from Southern Italy and, and really have quite a conversation in asking follow-up questions. And we've done this with, um, you can do it with a variety of topics. So electronic communication apps, uh, particularly on, ta on tablets, there are a variety of electronic communication devices, certainly um, much more complex than apps for, for persons um, who have uh, long standing communication difficulties. But we've been, and there are a variety of, of commercially prepared apps for iPad or Android tablets available. Some have voice output and some do not. I've worked with VitaTac company I have no interest or remuneration from the company, um, but have just served as a research partner to um, do the iterative user-centered kind of development of an app for electronic tablets, and it's called VitaTalk. And here are some of the features of this particular um, tablet app. Word picture icons for common messages, pain location and rating. You can see the, the menu of categories um, along this side of the face page of the app. Keyboarding, finger drawing page, 
and voice output for everything but the finger drawing. It also is available in different languages. So I'm just gonna share with you real quick a portion of right. a test for a, a patient who was unable to speak in the ICU. I am in pain. Thank you very much, sir. All right, for the third scenario, can you rate this pain for me? Say on a zero to 10 scale. My pain is a 10. Thank you very much. All right, this is patient two zeros. Okay, so that's just um, a quick example of how the person navigates the, um, the pages and that sidebar menu uh, to elicit the, the message. My doctoral student, Jiwan Shin, followed um, family caregivers of the patients that we enrolled in a clinical trial with the VitaTalk. And so she performed some interviews with um, family members who had received, whose patient had received the VitaTalk app. And the, the description that they gave was of an opening up of communication between the patient and their family. And so here is um, a quote her, by a husband. Her ability to use the tablet opened up communication that was the beginning of a more healthy attitude aiding her recovery. And we asked um, kind of before after questions, what was, what was communication like before? What was it like after? And he notes that after using the tablet, communication on all levels was achieved. So humor, financial, legal, and it was this door opening kind of um, experience. The most common message that um, families described was receiving an I love you um, from the patient using the voice output. And while there are lots of ways that we can indicate, you know, um, I love you, there's something about the, the voice output and, and the intentional use uh, and of this message that was profound for families. And so um, again, really, stressing having an individual communication plan that includes that you can take to health care visits, um, advocate for inclusion in the health electronic health record, um, and for nurses to uh, report to each other in shift um, the handoffs uh, about the, the special needs and uses. Uh, signals for yes, no, et cetera, that the patient might have, posting it in the room and including favorite topics or requests, as well as the so important that yes, no signal. This next slide is for Nicole, who, who is a Cubs fan. Um, this is as close as I could get to um, some, some Cubbies uh, for the day. Uh, what have we learned so far? That it takes a team um, and that the speech language pathologist is really an important driver of that team as is the, the, patient, the family caregiver and patient. Um, and so the speech language pathologist assessment can reveal unique patient abilities and characteristics and needs that even those um, uh, nurses who are trained in, 
can't quite get at because these are the specialists. Um, and we've also learned that communication difficulty affects everyone, uh, caregivers as well as patients, and that one size does not fit all and that we have to be prepared for our sizes to fluctuate. High tech communication with electronic devices can help, but much depends on patient ability, preference and access. So um, again, it's back to the speech language pathologist who can um, also engage uh, access um, devices, uh, switches, et cetera, for electronic um, communication devices. And in terms of treatment decision-making, planning ahead is the message. Um, so we have lots of evidence that patients who have communication impairments in the hospital setting can and should communicate about um, decisions or at least be involved in communication about treatment decisions. But speech language pathologists tell us that um, don't wait until uh, they're, the they're, they have um, significant communication impairment because it's hard for us to go in and train people on a device or a technique while we're waiting for decision making to happen, while we also have people standing in line to, about a decision. So having those tools or some training in place can, at the onset can be helpful. And again, here's some resources for those planning activities. Um, voice preservation is, a, is another avenue and John Costello is a speech language pathologist in Boston, at Boston Children's Hospital um, who pioneers this work and is expert um, in this regard. And um, he also works with ALS patients. Um, so I really recommend these videos that John of talks that John has done if you're interested in learning more about voice preservation. And so now I will um, thank you and and stop for questions. Thank you for that slide for the cubbies. <laughs> Good. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was just curious. I know that um, I have been a care specialist in my previous role with MDA, and I know I worked, I worked at the ALS Care Center, and they did a lot of voice banking um, in that aspect with the SLP. I was curious, though, we've got, um, I was curious, in order to attain a verbal communication device, is that something that insurance pays for, or is that through self-pay? Um, I knew this was going to be a <laughs> <laughs> a question that's a little out of my realm. Yeah. So okay. uh, the answer is it depends. Okay. Um, yes, it can be. Um, is there, does it take a lot of advocacy? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and here again, the speech language pathologists, the assistive technologies clinics are really well versed in um, how to navigate those um, regulations and particular insurers. Mm -hmm. um, and some, you know, some devices that are, are very expensive. Some devices mm -hmm. and mounts are, you know, upwards of $7,000. Um, you know, the iPads and iPad apps, much less, but. What about the conversation boards? Where could someone purchase those? Is that an Amazon purchase or do they have to go to a medical supply company? Um, you can Google it. It usually it's through. So like the, um, the Vita attack, mm -hmm. um, company. So you Google Vita attack. Okay. E I D A K dot com. And they have, boards, those medical communication okay. boards. 
Um, I don't know if you can buy a single one, but you can query them. Mm -hmm. Um, we usually buy them in bulk. They're like $19, but the, the website that I gave the Mm -hmm. patient provider communication forum has the printable sheets. And I am glad you asked that question because I meant to show that, um, we print out and put in just plastic provider, you know, plastic sheet protectors on, and a binder ring, some of these kinds of pr- you know, downloadable boards. And you can imagine printing them out and then like having them to grab and go uh-huh. for medical appointments or, you know, so what if there's an emergency and, exactly. and you have to call an ambulance and now your communication isn't so good because you're in pain or something. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I personally had that experience not too long ago. <laughs> Rip, gripping pain where I couldn't really <laughs> talk. And um, I should have known that these were in my closet. And I <laughs> them. Well, I couldn't get to them, but anyway, um, so this, and the, they can be individualized. So that's kind of my suggestion in terms of planning. I can see that being really, really beneficial for students, especially, you know, grade yeah. school, middle school, even elementary school, um, to send that with them with their, if their caretaker does go to school with them or even, you know, keeping it at school in the nurse's station or something they like tie that. That's it, great... They tie it on wheelchairs mm-hmm. yep. and yeah, absolutely. I think that would leave a lot of anxiety from parents too when they do send their kids to school. Um, at least they would have that method of communication. That's really yeah, and it's a it's a backup. Let's say the person does have an electronic device, but you know something goes wrong or the battery mm-hmm. runs out. Or um, so we really advocate the low tech backups. <laughs> we had someone. Um, comment laminate those because that would be the best yeah. option yes. Definitely laminate yes them. you absolutely can do that perfect thank you very much for being with us today a lot of great information and i will include that website on our post event email to everyone that uh, that viewed our session today as well good thank you thank you, thank you.